Okay, I think it's time to get started then. Uh, welcome, Uret Gitzar uh, of uh, Boston University. Um, it's great to have you in the uh, in the uh, language uh, circle. Before we allow you to to start, um, I uh, I'm mentioning uh, two uh, two issues. Um, the first one is that uh, everyone should be aware of the fact that this uh, presentation is being filmed by digital uh, computerized uh, filming equipment. Um, because we want to make the talks of the language circle available uh, on the uh, internet at some point. Um, if you uh, don't want to be filmed, then um, probably just shut your camera down. I think that that should be enough um, just for you to be aware of that. The second thing that I, that I need to announce is that um, we are muting everyone uh, throughout the meeting and we are in control of unmuting people later um during the uh q a and that's because we had uh occurrences of trolls in uh, in our uh, in our language circle and that disrupts of course the discussion so if you have a question later during the q a or during the presentation then uh, please just um make yourself uh, heard or, or seen in the chat uh pre-formulate your question there um, and then we are happy to uh, unmute you and give you a chance to ask your question and take part in the discussion. Okay, sorry for that that hassle. Um, it's just a safety uh, measurement. Um, so Odette, uh, uh, we are looking forward uh, to your uh, presentation. Uh, and uh, we're spending the next about 40 to 50 minutes listening to you, right? Thanks again for, for joining the language server, Odette. Okay, so I will stop sharing for one more time because I lost again my control and I understand why. So give me 10 seconds, okay? Okay, so I think, so thank you for hosting me. Uh, and I'm sorry about the, um, you know, the uh, fact that we had to push this, you know, uh, this meeting quite some time, you know, it was scheduled earlier, but I'm happy that finally we got to this point. Uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, my view of how oscillations are, uh, part of the uh, speech uh, understanding question. Uh, and my plan for today, oops, why is it not letting me go? Okay, so my plan for today is basically to go down memory lane and to tell you about how tempo was evolved. This will be kind of introduction to my Talmudic view of tempo. Talmudic means theoretical, philosophical, you know, function based. I will talk about nagging questions that are popping up, uh, especially we, within this view. And I will tell you my preference in terms of what I think is the answer to those questions. So this whole thing started you know, uh, somewhere about 2007 or so, and eventually ended up with the paper 2011. And there, a cortical computation principle was, you know, was formulated. Decoding of sensory input is guided by oscillators locked to the input rhythm. So the notion is you have oscillators locked to the input rhythm and they guide the decoding process. Uh, now, it, we suggested that it is a universal computation principle. We decided to use, you know, to use a case study, the speech perceptions, uh, you know, domain to show the utility of this principle believing that it should 
uh, show itself in other modalities as well. And since then, indeed, we see some interesting, you know, correlates to vision and, and, and whisking and so on. Now, Tempo was the name of the, uh, the, the name we, you know, we, we gave to this, uh, you know, to this um, system. And Tempo basically has two parts in it. One part is a segmentation path. You see the signal goes through the peripheral auditory system and the, uh, and the uh, you know, the um, sensory representation of the speech feeds to, do you see my cursor by the way? Hello? I don't hear you. Yes, I did. Okay, so so you see that that the uh, input feeds a, a you know a theta oscillator and a delta oscillator. The theta is also driving a gamma. Gamma is nested in theta. So that's the segmentation path. It sets up an array of oscillators that is locked to the input, and then. And those oscillators guide a decoding, uh, you know, circuitry that we will talk about it later. Now, it is noteworthy that um, in those days, you know, uh, we there were few of us talking frequently about this. I called it our orbit, uh, and uh, David Popol and Anlis Giraud. Charlie Schroeder, where you know we, it was in those days that we talked a lot in between us about those ideas, and out of that uh, came two papers. You know, a paper by myself that showed the the principle in terms of a block diagram. You know, I'm an engineering course, so we talk block diagrams. David and Anis published in 2012 an echo of this of the same ideas. Again, as I say, we those were developed hand in hand. And she, you know, and they had, you know, this kind of, um, of um, cartoon to describe how it goes. And you see, you have the signal, you see here, you know, the theta, and then the gamma within the theta and so on. The same ideas, but, you know, in different, through different lenses. Now, the segmentation path that sets up those oscillators defines chunks for to be processed later by the decoding circuitry. So let's talk about chunks. Here it is, you know, a speech. Um, it is a telephone number that is, uh, you know, being uttered in US style. You have the waveform, and below that the wideband spectrogram. And I hope I don't need to explain what the spectrogram is in East audience. One seven eight six zero oh, four nine. Now, when you talk about syllable long chunks, the question is, what is the acoustic correlate of a syllable? Even phonetician will not tell you exactly where it, where the boundaries are. That led to a 2013 paper of mine where I suggested to go into a, 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 you know, a unit of speech information that is defined by cortical function. I called it the theta syllable. I suggested that uh, if you take the mid, the, the vocalic nuclei or the mid vowel area as markers, and the oscillator, the theta is being locked to those markers. The cycles, you know, uh, each cycle represent a unit that I call a theta syllable unit. And uh, it is the speech fragment between mid vowel to the next mid vowel, which is basically a VCV unit. Uh, and um, here are you know, you see where the loudspeaker, you know, I will show you how it sounds. 
So those are the theta syllables I suggest as a well-defined definition of a syllable in the acoustic domain. Now we have also accentual chunks. Those are one second long or so. One, seven, eight, six, oh, four, nine. Those chunks are being defined by accentuation arcs. That's the way we, you know, we refer to them. And those are described preliminary in acoustic terms. So poses define the uh, accentual chunk, your, you know, melodic contour, let's, you know, um, let's say what we call intonation, intensity. How, and the, the neg a nagging question here is how to extract these, uh, these, these terms and how to integrate them. That's an issue that is still out there, you know, how you integrate all those cues into a marker that, that uh, you know, will indicate the boundaries of the accentuation chunk. Now, one thing that I want to emphasize here, the brain don't see the acoustics. Rather, it sees the cochlear output. Because I see in our community, people refer to, you know, the fact that speech is semi-periodic and they say that the oscillators are being uh, locked to the speech. That's not right because you are not seeing the acoustics. The brain sees the cochlear output. What output? What do I mean by that? Here is a waveform and here is a spectrogram of that waveform. But if you now run that speech through the cochlea and you just look at the basilar membrane, you know, fluctuations, we know that you can, you know, assume that the cochlea is a bunch, it can be viewed as a filter bank. It's a, you know, the basilar membrane itself is a continuum of filters, but then the inner hair cells that are discrete elements sitting along the cochlea and transform the mechanical motion into uh, spikes in the auditory nerve, they are discrete. So you can talk about cochlear channels. And I show here channels from 200 all the way to 3,800, roughly the speech domain for this particular speech. And now you look at each cochlear channel and you are filter, you know, you are extract the envelopes and filter them to 50 Hertz enough for intelligibility. And uh, you see those envelopes that, you know, evolve in time. And, you know, you have behavior that is temporal in view and that is the view the brain sees of speech. I mean, of course, these are being transformed to, to spikes and the spikes are going through different, uh, you know, relays in the auditory brainstem all the way to A1, somehow integrated there. And we assume that A1 sees that information as a function of the characteristic frequency of the channel, which is maintained throughout. Now, if you look at one particular envelope, you can define the, mod the modulation spectrum of that particular envelope. So we talk about what happens at 600 Hertz. The, you have an envelope, which is a time function. If you are now going to do a Fourier transform, let's say of this, you will see all the modulations amplitude and phase that you need to do in order to, to you know, resynthesize the envelope. And that is called the modulation spectrum. So you have time here and you have modulation spectrum here. And you see this, I picked up modulations between half a Hertz to eight Hertz. And each line here is the, you know, the, modul the, um, the uh, modulation frequent, you know, the behavior at that particular frequency of the modulation in amplitude and in phase. So, and we know that there are, 
you know, at A1, along the tonotopic axis, columns of modulation neurons that are tuned to those frequencies. So we believe that modulation spectrum is a um, perception related concept. But as I said, you know, each one of along, along the basilar membrane, you know, you have different kind of envelopes, therefore different kind of modulation spectra. And I'm going to show you a movie here where you have time in the, in the abscissa and you have modulation uh, um, uh, frequency in the ordinate and the cochlear channel is going down. That means when I run it, you will see how the modulation spectrum changes as function of the cochlear channel. So that's the view the brain sees of speech along the modulation, uh, the, the modulation neurons, you know, columns. And of course, you can now think of, of this representation in terms of a modulation spectrum cube, when you have time here, freq modulation frequency there, and it goes as function of characteristic frequency. So that's the kind of input you have to process in order to feed, let, you know, to, to, to get some notion of, you know, the um, syllabic markers, you know, the accentuation markers and so on and so forth. Now, going back to chunks and, os and relate them to oscillators, we think in terms of theta and delta oscillators. The theta frequency range is between three and nine. The delta frequency range, let's say, is half a hertz to two hertz. And both are synchronized with the you know, corresponding chunks. Theta cycle synchronize with the syllabic chunks. Delta synchronizes with the accentual chunks. Synchronizes means lock to. And what is interesting, important to note is that all oscillators, because of the fact that speech, you know, is 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 breathing with time. I mean, you know, you you talk you talk in a semi rhythm, a semi. You know, the rhythms are not atomic clock. Syllabic rate is not atomic clock. The oscillator, if you want to really have a nice synchronization, they have to breathe with the acoustics. That means we talk about flexible oscillators, oscillators that are not fixed sinusoids, but rather be able to flex, to change their frequency from cycle to cycle. Here is an example. You have a waveform here. And, and below the waveform, you have, you know, this blue period, semi-periodic waveform. This is, you know, the accumulated theta band modulations across CF from the modulation spectrum cubes. And you say each peak, you know, excites a marker that is relating to the mid vowels. So you have, a, you know, one cycle, I call it theta one, theta two is another cycle and so on. So you have a sequence of cycles of theta that you see are flexible. Usually we talk about stressed versus non-stressed. So this may be a stressed theta syllable. This is a non-stressed theta syllables and so on. Now, the uh, those, modulations drive a cortical theta oscillator. And we think in terms of a phase lock loop uh, concept where the, the um, variable, you know, co control, the, the VCO, the control, the oscillator inside the loop the, the, is the theta. That's the, so, so, so those thetas, are the VCO, the internal oscillator within the PLL loop, 
And, and let me tell you a little bit about what is a PLL, what is a phase lock loop. The classic view of, of it, by the way, this is a circuit come that is borrowed, you know, that is used in engineering. Um, and, you know, for example, you know, with, uh, you know, radio transmissions that you, used to be uh, FM radio system, this will sit in every receiver getting, you know, the carrier, the FM carrier and extracting from it the, the, the music, let's say. So what is the basic classic loop? You have a phase comparator that computes the phase difference between an input signal and an, a self-generated signal, the output of the voltage control oscillator. So he, here, let's say, you know, the 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 uh, blue is the input and let's say it is a sinusoid and the vco is also a sinusoid and you are looking at the phase difference between the two and you go through a loop filter you know to to look at the you know to take out you know the high uh, components that are uh, that may appear and then Change, you know, controls the VCO so that if you have an input like that, you know, and that's a MATLAB simulation of this circuit. If you take a chirp that goes from three hertz, from seven hertz to set to three, and then back to seven, using that concept that you are setting a VCO and looking at the phase difference, and trying to, to minimize the, the distance, the phase between the two by controlling the VCO, you are getting this VCO, and if you put them one on top of the other, you see how the frequency of the internal VCO changes together, breathe together with the input. And the, the model we suggest is that this is the theta locked to the input rhythm. Here is another view of a simulation. What if it is not a chirp, but you set up a random, you know, three to seven, and you can look and see that sometimes when there are sharp changes, you know, the PLL doesn't do a good job. It takes some time for it to, to recover. So back to tempo now. Here now, I, I, I want to show the relationship between the segmentation path and the decoding path uh, in tempo. So we have a pre-lexical tempo phase, which is dealing with the syllabic, uh, you know, durations. And the theta is being formed, locked to the input. Inside the theta, you assume nested gamma. And the gammas, via, they are sampled, the envelope, in, inside, you know, the theta, and create a syllabic gamma code. That's a neural code of the syllable that moves you know that moves uh, to the higher to the higher levels in the hierarchy, and the syllabic gamma code is assumed to be multiplexed at the end of the theta cycle. So you are having those gammas sample the in the you know the envelope, and then at the end of the cycle you multiplex it and you move on to the next one, and and, and so so. And, 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 you know, the, the oscillator, the VCO oscillator is evolving with time, uh, you know, according to the PLL circuitry and the gamma is nested in it. Now, let's think for a moment about the sequence of operations in this level. First, we have segmentation. That, that means we, we define a window, lock to the input via a VCO in a PLL circuitry, the phase 
you know, it is an evolving phase locking process online. Within that, you have the gamma that are sampling and creating the code. So this is now the, the decoding circuitry within the theta cycle. And at the end, we transmit the code. The second stage is the word recognition stage. And I, my preference is because I don't know of any oscillator that, lo that, that has the word duration, uh, something in between the, the theta and the gamma. Well, that's one of those sticking questions, you know. Are, is the lexical access process involve oscillations or not? I suggest no, but you know, of course, that's a um, that's an I you know an, an hypothesis, so to speak. So you integrate here the syllabic gamma code, the syllabic gamma codes over time, and it doesn't. It's not an oscillation based, uh, you know, circuit, and you get the words, and then you move to the accentuation, you know. Uh, the accentual segment or chunk where you integrate over time, you integrate over one delta cycle and you are going to create a phase constituent. It's not a, uh, it's not a phrase, but it's a phrase constituent. It's a candidate uh, at the end. It is being transmitted at the end of the delta cycle, which is about one second long, let's say. What are the sequence of operations here? We have segmentation where the window that defines the chunk is a delta. The delta again is a generalized, uh, you know, or analog to the, to the theta in, ter in terms of implementation, a VCO in a PLL, so it can breathe, evolves, uh, you know, in time. Now the parsing, process here uh, also evolves with delta, generates you know, phrase constituents candidates. It operates on syllables and words, not necessarily oscillation based. We don't know if the circuitry is oscillation based. All we suggest is that the chunk to be decoded is defined by oscillation, the delta. It is not necessarily sequential. I mean, you know, we know examples that you know what happens in the beginning before you even get to the end of the, of the fragment. And there is a content invoked feedback. Here it is here. You have some syntax invoked feedback, maybe by a beta and delta carrier, you know, that affects the operations inside the window. And the candidate is multi multiplexed further at the end of the delta cycle. So that's the view of tempo. Uh, and uh, one thing that is very important to note is that the sequence of operations is repetitive. So in, a, in the syllable level and in the phrase level, it repeats itself irrespective of the window duration. So if we are moving, you know, if the in every window, we do the exact same thing. We first define the window, and then there is a gamma sampling going on, and then it is transmitted. Same with whatever operation is taking place in the one second long chunks. You know, we have sequence of syllable uh, gamma codes, you know, and we have maybe words and they are coming together. And somehow we have a process that integrate those together. Uh, and it's the same kind of integration process, maybe, you know, taking into account the prior probabilities, you know, taking, uh, that's the reflection of context in the Bayesian framework, for example, but it's the same sequence of operations, irrespective of the window length. Now, one word about the gamma code. 
if we look at the output of the cochlea, there are all those channels. The gamma code is the sampling within the theta window along the gamma, you know, uh, you know, cycles of those in you know, envelopes, and there is, we can implement it by a neural circuit. And the code is the the multidimensional representation of that of that neural of that uh, neural representation. So that's the gamma code of a theta syllable. And the readout, you know, uh, may be complex. We don't know. I don't. I, I didn't deal with the readout yet. One more thing before I finish with this down memory lane part. What is nice about this, uh, you know, uh, of this system is that if the syllabic rate, the input syllabic rate is within the theta range, the array or within the, the, the delta range, the array of oscillator stays locked to the input. So if you look at the syllabic example, and let's say that this is the normal, you know, the, the uh, nominal rate, and we have the theta locked to the peaks here, and we have the gamma phase locked to the theta because of nesting, uh, you know, the, the samples are, the, the, here are the samples. Now, what happens if you compress, time compress the speech by two? So you compress the acoustics, but the theta is locked to the acoustics. It breathes, you know, that's, that's the fees, you know, that's the assumption. And the gamma is nested within the theta. So if you look at the code, it's the exact same code. The code is invariant. If you are now, you know, compressing it by three or four, it would be exactly the same, but theta has a limited range. Theta doesn't go between eight or nine hertz. So at some point, when you compress too much, theta is stuck. It's it's, and then you lose synchronization, and that's what happens. You know, outside of the theta range, the array is out of lock, and there is a drop in performance. We know that intelligibility drops. Or, or actually, I should say, the intelligibility stays un, unchanged, you know, until you get to something like to a speed or compression rate of about nine syllables per second. Then suddenly there is a drop. And it is because, that's the theory, the, because the, um, uh, you know, the, the S oscillators are out of lock. Uh, that happens also with theta, and we show that, by the way, uh, with in a paper with uh, you know Johanna, in the in the delta range, we played with the speed uh, of the accentuation uh, arcs inside and outside delta, and we measured MEG, you know, uh, periodicities, and we show that as long as you are inside delta periodicity is maintained and you lose them if you're outside Delta. So what is nice about this is that it is lead in it, 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 at least in terms of the time dimension, you know, of phonemic variability, we have, we have a candidate. So I want now to shift to this, uh, suggestion that from functional viewpoint, the oscillators are actually cortical, can be viewed as cortical pacemakers. Uh, how am I with time? 10 minutes. So I'm going to talk about cortical time units. I call them CTUs. And I'm going to talk about that uh, we, you know, but before going that, I just want to say that the cortical computation principle that we that was suggested in 2011 
can be rephrased. The coding of sensory input is spaced by cortical clock implemented as oscillators lock to the input rhythm. So I want to get the notion of the clock. And what does it give us in terms of understanding? So as I said, you know, this principle can work not just for speech, but let's talk about speech. And let's, uh, so the clock units are determined by the acoustics. I'm talking about theta CTU with the duration in Newtonian times of one theta cycle and a delta CTU with duration of one delta cycle. In Newtonian time, the CTUs are different in duration, but in cortical time, they are uniform. Uniform in the following sense, the sequence of operations executed within each CTU is identical, irrespective of the Newtonian duration. So I'm saying, you know, inside you have a clock and with that clock paces, you know, the operations uh, and it's the same sequence of operations. Uh, uh, that's the way, you know, you can pictorially can think about it. You know, you have those du Newtonian times, um, CTUs and how in cortical time they have the exact same duration. Now, very important conclusion that comes out of this. The decoding process must stay in lockstep with the input. If you are lose, losing the lockstep, you lose performance. And the lockstep is maintained by the clock. The clock paces the decoding process to stay in sync with the linguistic information flow, syllables and phrase constituents. And it keeps the decoding process operating on acoustic chunks aligned with proper linguistic units. And those linguistic objects must be determined by the end of the CTU to maintain a lockstep. Now, what happens when the input is too fast beyond the range of the oscillators? The CTUs are no longer aligned with proper linguistic units, the synchronization in loss, and that's what you see. You take the exact same signal that is shown up here and you compress it by three. Suddenly, the, you know, the thetas in this particular example are stuck to their highest you know, or the shortest duration, and and the acoustics inside is not any anymore uh, aligned with syllable uh, theta syllables. So you are you are you know losing performance. Now, before continuing, just an axiom that I think is very important to remember. First, uh, you know. Uh, the assumption is that correct chunking is a prerequisite for a reliable decoding. You, you know, if you are not doing a correct chunking, you will hurt decoding. And the second axiom is we need, I mean, I'm not sure that we are all aware of the concept of the da of, of co-articulation in terms of speech production. And, and the co-articulation is central. It define and, and it is being defined acoustically by the concept of dyads. So we have a C into V dyad, we have a V into C dyad, and we have a C into C dyads. And those, the, the, the C and V are text units, but they are expressed in the acoustics like that. So if I'm looking at the time domain and I'm looking at the spectrum, and I'm just indicating what is a C into V, uh, you know, uh, boundary or edge, we call it. Those are in red. There are V into C edges. And I, in blue, I showed where are the vocalic nuclei, that is the mid vowels. So if you see the red, you know, every such edge is between a consonant for example, here is a B into R. And here we have S 
into a less for slide and so on. Here is the, you know, the the into a and so on. You have the V into C boundaries or edges, right? That are going from A into B and from A into S and so on. And you see the mid vowels. The mid vowels are in the mid vowel area. And you see, by the way, that in continuing speech, you never have, rarely have flat formants. That is, you know, it's always dynamic when you are here you know, in this area and the law, and you move along with time, you already plan your articulators for the next. And the mid vowel, if you look at it, is the most salient part of the acoustics in terms of signal to noise ratio and so on. So I wanted to, to share with you the, the concept of the dyad. Then one more thing, we, we ran experiments, you know, uh, in the past, there, are, there is evidence that for perception viewpoint in everyday speech, the dyad is the atom, you know, it's the smallest meaningful unit. Uh, and there is a phonological superiority of the C into V in terms of the information of that atom. So how am I with time? Not good. Chunking. Let me talk about chunking uh, in the syllable level. I'm suggesting that we have two independent issues that we have to consider in chunking. What are the acoustic markers for the chunking Let in, of the, that feed the theta? And what is the tracking circuitry? The acoustic markers can be vocalic nuclei or acoustic edges. I prefer the vocalic nuclei and I will say why in a moment. In terms of tracking circuitry, I'm suggesting the PLL concept and not the phase reset co co concept. And let me explain why. In terms of acoustic markers, let's assume that acoustic edges are the markers. It doesn't make sense, and why? Because the consonantal part and the vocalic part of the same text C are split between two successive windows. If you are suggesting that you put the window between you know, the, uh, those edges, then the, cons the consonantal part of the coarticulated C and the vowel part, which are the same dyad, are split into two successive windows. And another thing, which is possible by awkward, but awkward, how you differentiate between C into V edge and between V into C edge. Because if you are, you know, you have two edges in succession, and then it is not theta anymore, but it is two times theta. So there may be some circuitry that prefers C into V, but I, I think it's a little awkward to me in terms of function. Also robustness of the edge to noise. The moment you have noise, the edge boundary is beginning to be kind of, uh, you know, uh, muddled. And that's an issue. With, if you take the vocalic nuclei as a marker, so the, 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 the object, is a V sigma, v, sigma sits for, uh, uh, you know, not just one C, maybe C followed by another C inside. So the C, that, that is, you know, the sigma or the V into C and then C into V, that's the most important par part of the information transfer. So uh, I, I just put here, you know, uh, UA ran, you know, some phonology statistics that he published, and um, maybe you should look into it. Now, in terms of, of circuitry, tracking circuitry, phase reset or VCO, if you assume that is a phase reset mechanism, I'm saying it doesn't make sense. And why? Because the window, if you are keep phase resetting it, will never finish full theta cycle. You are going to start with the phase reset one cycle before it ends. 
or maybe after it ends, you are going to reset it again. So you are now moving, you know, I, I think that it supports oscillation desi nay desires that say it's not oscillation at all, but it is a, an ERP based, you know, uh, uh, you know, um, reset, you know, uh, marker uh, 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 mechanism. So I suggest a VCO in a PLL with instantaneous tracking of the input, the way I just showed before, and I'm not going to go beyond. Let's talk about decoding. Okay, syllable objects are generated by gamma sampling. What is the neural circuitry for the gamma sampling? Is it nesting that keeps the gamma in phase with theta? Or is it a basal ganglia thalamus loop? I don't know. And if the syllable object is determined at the end of the theta cycle, the object cannot be changed. Is, uh, is the interpretation, is the function of the word accentual unit de derivation, that is the prior probabilities in terms of the Bayesian inference framework may be updated with time. That's a question. And I'm suggesting that there is no role for active sensing here. You cannot override the acoustics of the previous theta cycle after you know it happened. And uh, unless you know is thinking in terms of maybe there are betas, you know, that that affect the gamma for the next theta. Uh, I will skip that. I mean, there are two publications that relate to this. Uh, and I don't have time to, you know, to describe the, that. That's that's a paper by Yulia and Eddie, and also uh, Peter Lakatosh suggested something that that you know relate was related to uh, to the uh, formation of theta. So I will finalize by think talking about the world and exceptual levels. In the world level, no chunking in world level. That means you don't have to track in terms of world level. The, the words are derived by models of lexical access, let's say trace. In the accentual level, chunking is by having delta locked, you know, to the accentuation marks and the decoding within the delta, the input are syllabic objects. The words are derived within the delta CTU. The output uh, is a phrase constituent candidate, not necessarily aligned with linguistic phrasal units. And we need to remember caveats here. It, the process doesn't have to be oscillation based, doesn't have to be sequential. And there is context uh, feedback, in, uh, which is the role of the priors. And if you go to the phrasal level, it is integrating sequence of P, of those constituents within a supra delta CTU. This is something that I know Lars is interested in. Thank you, and I'm sorry it took a little longer. I don't hear you. No, we are trained in silently clapping. <laughs> uh, okay, now uh, I hear you. That's not true. Thank you for the for the beautiful presentation, Odette. I think you did a, did a great job in like cramming all that wealth of of thinking and uh, intellectual uh, brilliance into fifty minutes. It's thank you, thank you. I'm beyond so. Pleasure. The floor is open for discussion, and uh, I would first check whether we have any one who would like to ask a question um, online. So please uh, make yourself visible in the chat if you want to ask Odette a question. 
Uh-huh. Yes. Hmm. Nothing in the chat. Okay, maybe we have maybe we have uh, questions here in the room in uh, in the Leipzig headquarter. Huh? Uh, Lorenzo has a question. Hi, Dad. Hi, Lorenzo. Um, it's time since we we talked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good to see you, and uh, thanks for the beautiful talk. I really enjoyed it to hear like for a while long by um, all these ideas and make it clearer. Um, I had a couple of questions still, actually, to clarify even further um, about this model. So um, on the um, on the delta and the theta. Um, you pose two, uh, uh, like a BCO and inside a PPL, a PLL for theta, uh, and that you assume to be more like based on an oscillator because to like uh, lock to the acoustics, uh, to the syllable, to this vocalic nuclei or whatever can mark a syllable, um, we need to adjust uh, the oscillator to reduce the phase difference uh, with this. Uh, Input that's correct in theta. Well, you see, let's first take a step backwards. I suggest a flexible a, a neuronal mechanism that that has the flexibility, so that when it is locked to the accentuation marks markers. And let's assume that those, just for simplicity, the pauses, you know, the pauses between those accentuation, you know, accentual chunks, those are, I played with it a lot. Those are the most, you know, uh, robust, I think, markers. But, you know, people say that intonation is an intensity. I don't know how to integrate them yet. Let's assume pauses. So when one pause to another pause, and let's say that a pause creates a marker, you know, that defines the duration of that, of that accentua accentuation chunk, accentual chunk. Now, the next one is going to be different in length. And I'm saying we need an, a, 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 a neuronal mechanism that will be able to create a window between those chunks. And the only way I know to do that is with a phase lock loop kind of circuitry. But yeah. it doesn't have to be. So the moment you tell me, okay, I have another beautiful realization of a flexible oscillation like that, I'm going to buy it. But the importance is to have a mechanism that will be able to put a window of a one second long or so length, and those are changing. And what I showed with, what Johanna and I showed, you know, and David was part of it, is that, you know, if you run experiments and you are measuring MEG periodicities in different ROIs, region of interest there, in the STG area, we see those periodicities very clear. If you are inside the two hertz, but you are outside, you don't have those periodicities. I'm not talking now information processing. I'm just talking chunking. Okay. Did I answer you, Lorenzo? Actually, I was taking even a step back, uh, even from that. I was starting from the from the syllable, from the theta uh, oscillation. Uh -huh. uh, and there, though, with the same type of mechanism of adjusting... Uh, a flexible oscillator, you dare assume it, assume it to be an oscillator, right? That is flexible, yes. but in theta, it is assumed to be an oscillator, but in delta, uh, locking to this, uh, like, more like... Why not? Yeah, the same, it's anal it analogous, the but same I, mechanism. But but you say there, you, you try and stress a bit more that it doesn't have to be an oscillator when we talk about delta, but not when we talk about theta. No, 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 no. No, no, I was talking about the decoding process okay. within the window. So okay. in the theta, I suggest that the gamma oscillator, you know, samples the envelope. So an oscillator is involved 
and the, os the gamma is in phase with the theta so that it's going to be consistent if you are compressing by two. So in the theta, in the syllabic level, I have a model that involves oscillations, not only in chunking, but also in creating the code, the gamma code. But in theta, in delta, I don't know, I don't have yet a solution how to integrate the sequence of gamma codes that are coming in terms of syllable, how they are integrated. There, I'm not sure that oscillations are involved. And I think, Lorenzo, you were involved with that project that, you know, uh, uh, yeah. Lars and Johanna and you and I were thinking about. That was the first I, step, I think, that as far as I know, of running an experiment that will ask the question, does a delta involve, you know, in, in the decoding within the delta. So that's why at that, in those, at that project, we talked about acoustic delta, remember, and then decoding delta. Yeah, I remember well, and that's why I'm still so interested in the question. So if you ask me, I'm still very interested. Yeah. No, no, but, but you see now that, that, that the delta in terms of the uh, segmentation function is analogous to the theta. Okay. But the question is, is there a decoding delta, a different type delta somewhere else that also deals with the decoding process? And yeah. that is something we didn't demonstrate yet. Yes, and I think to this uh, um, point to follow up, you had a slide where you showed, uh, I think it was in the um, cortical time units, huh? the multiple cortical time units, when we see that we have uh, some sort of variability in uh, the in Newtonian time uh, on mm -hmm. the different chunks. Uh, but then uh, these are somehow made uh, uh, more regular at the second level, at the brain's, in brain's time. Uh, in that case, like if we draw a line that continues from the Newtonian time of the input to the brain time, and we say that if the line goes straight down, uh, we have a, an angle of zero degrees. Uh, but then when we want, when we have like a irregular Newtonian time and we want it to make it regular, then we need to like make a, this angle with positive or negative uh, values, right? So we need to either like anticipate or delay. So how does this anticipation also, uh, is it the right way of seeing it? Or uh, how do we like uh, go from uh, uh, an irregular time to a regular one? Like uh, what is the mechanism that allow that flexibility? So, all right. So you see uh, the markers, the acoustic markers that you know, that define the boundaries of the window, of the delta window. The, you know, the, the duration is, is uh, changing. It is not the same in Newtonian time. Now, when I talked about C, delta CTU in the cortex, it was, it was in the following sense within that Newtonian time duration, you, the cortex runs the exact same of sequence of operations, which is repetitive. Doesn't matter if the Newtonian time is short or long. And in that sense, you can think of the brain of the cortex works on an atomic clock, you know, internal atomic clock where the units you know, in terms of the sequence of operations that are being taken in the brain is the exact same and they behave the same. And you might say that the uh, clock is ticking in, you know, in the same fashion, but not in, in Newtonian time. So you see what I'm saying? I'm not suggesting that in the, in the segmentation domain, you know, you are getting new uniformity. The segmentation will, will yield, you know, non-uniform 
windows in Newtonian time, but in the cortex, you know, in terms of the operations to lead to the PCC, you have the exact same, uh, you know, um, sequence of operations. Th that's that's my thinking, at least. And again, it is Talmudic. The next question is from the chat, actually. So uh, Alice Turk has a question. Um, yes, I actually have um, two questions. Sorry, I'll... I'll um... Hello. Um, hello, hello. <laughs> Thank you for your very interesting talk. Oh, thank um, you. I, I have two questions. So the second one is actually relating to that um, point about cortical um, atomic clock units. So we know that um, perceptually differences in timing are important for various kinds of operations like um, word recognition and um, detecting phrase, well, some people think they're relevant for detecting phrase boundaries and other kinds of, of things. So timing is important. It's also important for um, detecting things like place of articulation of consonants. So ba versus wa, format transition, timing, etc. So you're, you're not proposing that that timing information is lost, are you? No, 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 I'm not okay. saying that at all. Uh, you, 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 well, you see, that's the enigma, don't you think? You know, I think that within the, the uh, theta window, you know, you know, all that information that you are talking about lives within, especially if you buy the notion of the mid vowel to mid vowel, I mean, the theta syllable, then all those things that you are talking about, you know, all those cues that are so important are, are are inside that window. Moreover, they are in the middle of the window. That's the most important part of the window and the, the, the best opportunity to get all that information. That's why I like the mid vowel to mid vowel and I don't like windows that are from the, you know, the edge to an edge because you break all that information. But I had an objection to that, actually, if I may chip in. So you were mentioning that the most important information in phonology is around the vocalic nucleus. And I'm not sure whether that's true from an information. No, no, no. No, that's exactly, the, I, I'm saying the opposite. Ah, the so vocalic nuclei, if you take this view, define the, the edges of the, of the window. The window is between one vocalic nuclei to the next. Ah, but so the bulk of the information is in the middle of that window. Okay, okay. Well, that makes more sense because you have more consonants than vowels in the languages. Of That's both. correct. Oh no, and the articulation from mid vowel to the consonant uh, cluster, and you have a cluster, and then from the cluster back to the next vowel. All this co-articulation is inside the middle of that window. And that's why I'm saying that it doesn't make sense to me, or at least I don't see how, maybe there is a, but I don't see it, how you can say that the window goes from the, let's assume that you can distinguish V into C from C into V. And let's assume that the edges are the C into V edges, you know, with, with onset, you know, the, with vowel onsets and all that. So, but, but you have the marker being the edge. Once you do that, that's exactly what you just objected now. I'm if sorry. From, mid, from um, edge to edge, the mid vowel will be in the middle of the sentence, of the window. Bye. That's what happens with managers. Can, can I ask a question that relates to that? So, Please. Um, so you, you talked about how um, the stage of word recognition, but if you have these V to V um, chunks, V to V syllable chunks, then those won't necessarily, won't line up with the edges of words say you have a word that's a CVC word, then yeah. your VCV unit won't line up with that. So how do you see word recognition? Great, que great question. 
You know, this is something that David and I, oh, by the way, I want again to emphasize that whatever I'm talking about, you know, I'm calling it, we have an orbit of people, you know, few of us that talk for some 15, 20 years now on these issues. And, uh, you know, we, we talk about it over and over again, and we define things that we don't have the answers to. So one of those is it relates exactly to your question. We don't, so, so David says, what we still have to find is a map between those syllable, you know, theta syllables to phones. Because we know that, it, that you know, that, um, you know, uh, for production, you know, you have phone de de derived production, for example. So how do you have a map between those? And that's exactly the question you ask, and I don't have an answer to that. Okay, thank and you. Another, another thing that I don't have an answer to, by the way, is you have a delta chunk, and inside the delta chunk, you have theta chunks. But the thetas are from mid vowel to mid vowel. So, what happens when, from the pose to the next mid vowel? Right, I mean, so how how to, I mean, there should be a way to make sure that we, you, when you are in the accentuation window, the, the beginning, you know, of the acoustics within the accentuation window, maybe it is a word, the beginning of a word or whatever should be taken into account outside the theta, you know, the gamma code of the, of the theta. So that's yet another question to be asked. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Does anyone else have any questions? Stephanie, I see your picture. I always learn from your questions. Hello, Oded. Very nice. Hi. To Hi, uh, I would love to ask you why you are certain that we need to chunk instead of constructing. So how do you decode by constructing without having windows? Well, one possibility that I hope someone will explore is that you hypothesize a phrase-sized representation and you uh, interpret the evidence as it's coming in uh, to test your hypothesis. So if I if I understand, so so okay, so. The way I understand what you are saying is within the notion that the perception process is a sequence of operations by which you first uh, uh, build, a, you know, based on, on a priori models and so on, based on the Bayesian approach, you build an expectation, a model inside, and then once the acoustic comes, you somehow translate it and see if it fits the expectation. Is that the, the framework of what you are talking? And then the question is, you know, how to, def how, is that what, am I right in terms of understanding what you are alluding to? I would add one more thing, and clearly this is nothing but a concept at the moment. Uh, and that is that what's coming in is a sequence of acoustic cue patterns. Right. And you are doing massive reduction or massive clarification. Those cue patterns are going to be very different, but there will be cues in both cases. Yeah. Uh, but 
maybe let me focus down a little more sharply on something that I think Alice was also uh, asking you. Um, I really like your remark that if you treat acoustic edges, Ken Stevens used to call them landmarks, but exactly those places where you get massive changes across the, the uh, spectrum. If you treat those edges as the boundaries of chunks, you lose information. That is very insightful, I think. But I believe it's equally true that if you don't include the whole vowel in your chunk, you also lose important information about duration. And I think that's what Alice, one of the things that Alice was um, mentioning. So um, if you can go from one acoustic edge to another and include the vocalic nucleus between those, mm -hmm. then you don't lose that information. So would you entertain the possibility that you have two kinds of chunks? Yes, one of course. Vowel to mid vowel and the other acoustic edge to acoustic edge? Yeah, well, you know, so now again, you know me by now, I'm open minded. You know, so I have no problem with an entertaining, but and let me open find it. Yes, but but again, you know, why do I think again? You you know, you are in a better situation to assess how important the vowel duration is in terms of EQ in everyday speech. See, again, I'm going back to the everyday speech. When I'm looking at the spectrogram, wide band spectrogram of everyday speech, I rarely see vowels, you know, that are steady. You are always moving, you know, from one C to the other C through the V. And when you are beginning to articulate the V, you already talk about how to articulate the next C. You have that strategy going on, which is, in succession. And that's why I thought, you know, the dynamics carries the information. But if at some point the duration, you know, is also important, we might include, we have to include it somehow. We'll have to think how, is it in parallel processing or is it within somehow the VCV, the syllab, you know, the, the, uh, VCV to somehow find, you know, some cue of duration. I don't know. I just don't have enough. But, but, but I thought that you talked about something that is much more interesting to me. Uh, sorry about that, that I'm giving ranking to, to what you said. Uh, you know, the notion of expectation, the fact that what you are listening to is in acoustics, and let's not argue if those are the envelopes or those are succession of uh, of cues, you know, or, or, or features, you know, that you can extract first, but you have a stream of those. And the question that you posed, and I, th I find it very interesting, uh, uh, if you assume, you know, what Boothroyd used to talk about, Arthur, you know, that, you know, you are having that sequence and uh, what, what, the perception process is that you decide if the you know if the expectation you know that you built internally is right or wrong to to explain that sequence and i wonder if 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 we can if the if the uh, chunking process is not part of it that somehow the chunk you know, or the, the window tells you, listen, that is what you are expecting, you know, in terms of the internal. I, I don't know. That's a very interesting question. Or do we have a success? Do Can we abandon the notion of, of windowing within the, uh, the Arthur Boothroyd framework? I don't know. That is something that I'll think about. Most likely, Oded, we need both. Mm-hmm. I would yeah. like uh, I, I, I agree. I I think that in principle there's no reason why we should be bound to choosing one or the other and get into, you know, debates about that per se. So I mean that's supporting Oded's point of view, but 
as some people know, I've worked in the time domain for decades. <laughs> and, um, you know, I, I don't see that these things are in conflict with each other. I, I will, and that isn't to say that we understand the mechanism by how they're integrated or anything of the kind. I'm not pretending otherwise, but I do believe that it's very likely we are, we're observing parallel processing that could be construed in the frequency and the time domains respectively, and that they're not at odds with each other. By the way, if people don't know the person that just spoke, this is Janet. Janet, tell you know, and, and she's an old friend of ours. She formed, you know, the company. I, you know, Dragon, it was at the beginning, you yeah. know, <laughs> or, you know, of uh, recognition, automatic speech recognition. So, you know, she's going all the way back. I don't know how many years. I don't want to say maybe it's not polite. These days, <laughs> she is interested in brain functions and so on and with speech in, in the background. Yeah, Janet, I, I, Janet Baker. Yeah, I'll just say a word. I'm I'm in the Boston area and was attached to MIT from the time, and doing neurophysiology with Jerry Letfren from the time I was about 15. And I moved from um, neuroscience into speech recognition. And um, my husband and I founded the company Dragon Systems. Its technology ultimately became the speech recognition in Siri. And um, but we've been away from that for I don't know 20 years now. Um, and I've returned back to my uh, neuroscience roots <laughs> and have oh, well, been working with Oded on a regular basis and Peter Cariani. So if people didn't hear the beginning, Janet was a PhD student of Jerry Latvin. Well, if actually, people know, hmm? um, yeah, and um, but I was at Rockefeller University in the Heartline Lab and so forth. Well, more so, more questions, guys. Oh, and also point and and connected to the Reichart um, uh, Institute, Max Planck Institute uh, in Tübingen, where I was for a year. Ah, Chet. Wait a second, let me see what is in the chat. Alice. No, no questions in the chat. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, not related to this, uh, oh, that is me again. <laughs> um, about frequency and times, I also see this point uh, uh, that the two views are not incompatible with each other and uh, I, I agree with uh, um, the idea that it's likely a combination of both. We still need the windowing and it can still be a, a, a construction uh, process, uh, the decoding of speech. Um, but we, you said you, we are missing something, right? For instance, in the Delta, we don't know exactly whether something is nested into it. We have doubts about the um, links between Delta and Theta. And I was wondering if you have ideas on other frequency bands we just heard, like also frequency and time, um, like <laughs> dynamics of uh, brain dynamics in these dimensions. So, so I was wondering about um, other frequency bands that could play a role in this model for temporal predictions, for instance, within a delta cycle, if you have uh, a place for them as well. Like, like beta, for instance. Well, you know, uh, Janet and Peter Cariani is here also. I mean, if you see him on the list, uh, <laughs> and I are uh, frequent visitors of a weekly meeting that Dan, Dan Gibson is organizing at MIT. And the, the people that are coming to that meeting are interested in the wetware, you know, the, the really biophysical and biological and neurophysiological aspects of the brain function. And I, here is Peter. And I, am, and I am going there just to learn because I learned so much about, from these people, about you know the the the, uh, the 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 wet aspects of the neural processing, 
Uh, so one thing, and Nancy Coppel comes there as well. Now, Nancy was talking for quite some time now about the fact that depending on you know, your understanding of how the cortex works, you know, the, there is a, an information transfer across layers, you know, from L4, which gets the input, you know, from the thalamus, and Peter can correct me, uh, from L4 all the way to the superficial, and then for the superficial back. And then she talks about gamma going up, beta going down, uh, you know, and so on. Uh, so, so but, but you know, the question again is, is there any meaning to that in terms of function? Unless mm -hmm. uh, just published a paper, you know, with Sevada on their circuit where they have a gamma sampling within a theta, but I, if I understand correctly that concept, the gamma is uh, frequency may change, you know, within the nesting uh, according to a beta, uh, a beta carrier, you know, that changes somehow the, the gamma. Um, one more thing that I can tell about this, you have Bastiansen. Have you heard of Bastiansen? You probably did in the Lars group. Yes, yes, of course. I mean, so Bastiansen once showed that if you look at the gamma, at the beta amplitude, not frequency, the beta amplitude can change or is an indicator of whether a sentence in the sentence level uh, is uh, kosher, is legit or not. Do you know of that work? Yeah, I know partially that work, yes. I mean... Um... So, so here is a, an evidence that may be a beta as a carrier. Remember in my block, in the tempo block, I suggested beta and delta as context-depending feedbacks. As, as carrier, the reason that I call that I, you know, listed maybe as carrier is because of Bastiansen, because he talked about how that carrier, the amplitude is changing, and the amplitude with time is an indicator whether or not the sentence is legit or not. Yeah. So that's all I know about this. Yes. So uh, at higher frequencies, we know that also they um, they tend to stay more local uh, and to travel less. Uh, far, uh, less far in space. So um, when we when we look at the beta being a, a carrier and then translating uh, to to delta and to theta, like um, some something has to some um, structure has to tell whether something is legit or not, and then it can communicate it with beta, for instance. Uh, and then this information can travel also in uh, in delta around the perhaps. So what I'm asking is if there is, uh, if someone has um, a, a model that integrates all of this uh, information uh, based on, uh, on the evidence, because I think uh, there is a lot of evidence already out there about uh, all of these uh, dynamics. So um, yeah. <laughs> I agree. I agree with that, you know, it, it should be integrated, but again, you know, that, in terms of your, your group uh, focus, you know, you are more focusing uh, into supra delta. You talk about, you know, sentence length or full phrasal length. Those are windows of integration. I, it's beyond my paycheck. You know, I, I never looked into supra theta into how you integrate uh, constituent candidates, you know, and then apply rules of language into it. I mean, I don't know much about it. And I guess in that range, that uh, feedback that Bastiansen was talking about comes into mind. That's at least my, my knowledge goes there uh, up to that point. 
One thing that I should add, by the way, is the role of alpha. There were papers, you know, from uh, Weiss, I think, you know, in, in Austria, I think, he, that Al and also uh, Oblesser, Jonas, where alpha is somehow associated with, with noise. Remember those papers? Uh, so he talked about th the fact that, you know, alpha is somehow involved with, um, um, uh, you know, resist, you know, perform better in noise or something like that. Mm -hmm. And then there is another thing that I wanted to mention. And this is a project that I am now um, working on. Uh, and it is the notion of closed loop perception. I'm, you know, Eud Achisar and I are collaborating on it with people, you know, with Skylar Jennings in Utah. And the, the notion is that, that you know, uh, you have to consider loops, uh, cortical to sensory loops. So that's the closed loop perception notion. For example, in vision, you know, when you are asked to scan a picture, let's say, uh, you know, you have a, a picture of of a, of people dining, or I'm looking at your table right now, okay, in the Zoom, and I have to to say who is attending, so my eyeball goes from one face to the next in some manner, and the notion is in close to perception that I see the first face, I send it back to the cortex, and the cortex tells me, move your eye now to the next one, and so on and so forth. So I'm scanning the, the, the picture in a closed loop manner. And the question that Eud and I and Skylar ask, do we have the same process in hearing as well? Because we are not moving our ears, right? And we want to push the notion that the cochlea changes its operating point as a, as part of a of a cortical cochlear loop, and that's what we are looking at right now. How, again, cortical cochlear means we are talking about high level processing that controls the cochlea. Can we think about that? Is it true? And if true, how oscillations are integrated inside that loop, what kind of oscillations and so on and so forth. So I thought it's relevant to your question, Lorenzo. Yes, totally. I'm very interesting to, to hear about this, uh, uh, this thing. Uh, this uh, again is new to me. I think you, I remember you already talking about, uh, about that probably a year ago or so. Yeah, that, that's of when we were starting on that. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, if you have more uh, to say about that, I think uh, I'd be interested, of course. No, not, not, not now. I, I actually, yeah. I have to leave in a minute because uh, I was, I was told, you know, you know, Caroline talked about a year, an hour and a half, and I yes, have some. And that's over now. <laughs> I think it's good yeah. if we can wrap it up. If if there's no more urgent questions, I would say thank you, that. Oh, it was pleasure, and thank you for giving me the platform. And yes. thank you for all those wonderful questions. Thank you, Dr. Bye. 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 And thanks, everyone, for giving me <laughs> my...